Good afternoon, everybody. The title of this, this conversation took a long time for us to decide, and I decided to take Dr. King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos, Our Community. I think it's relevant then, 50 years ago, and it's relevant now. And uh, we want to talk about where we are within the context of uh, the situation we're in, in trans institutional racism and uh, monopoly capitalism, sexism, gender identity, socialism, intersectionality, pan-Africanism, mother nature, climate change, et cetera. And where are we at this point? So the question is, where do we go from here at KSR Community? We'll start out with Professor Davis, uh, tell him what you think about where we are and uh, where do we go and how do we get there under the context of where do we go from here, chaos or community? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation sponsored by the Pan-African Film Festival. Um, thank you, Babu. We've known each other since the late 60s when we did community organizing together. It's an honor to be in conversation with Gerald Horn, whose phenomenal research I've been following and learning from for many, many years, and uh, Melina Abdullah, whom I've gotten to know, respect, and learn from over the more recent uh, period. Uh, um, where do we go from here? Um, you know, at the end of Dr. King's book, um, he, he makes the point uh, that um, there's a there's a kind of deadline looming. Uh, he talks about the fierce urgency of now. And, and, and he points out that if we don't take advantage of the moment, then uh, the moment will be lost. Uh, and in a sense, I think we missed the deadline that Dr. King was uh, referring to. Um, we, we tried to address um, racism uh, which requires structural transformation with, with strategies of assimilation. And, 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 and I think, you know, not all of us, of course, but I think that has been the overwhelming uh, response. Uh, and, and also too often, we don't really know how to define chaos because uh, the chaos that we see oftentimes serves the goals of those who value profit over human beings, those who are only interested in the capacity to produce and reproduce wealth. So, and so as Dr. King pointed out for this question, where do we go from here to resonate? We have to have some understanding of where we are today. Uh, and, and for those of us who are living out this moment, it's not always apparent. As a matter of fact, we tend to be too fixated on the present without apprehending the past that produced the present and without reflecting on the way this um, present will produce the future. Uh, but let, let me conclude by saying, I think this current moment is one that we've been striving for over the decades. We've wanted a collective awareness of racism as a structural and systemic phenomenon. And that awareness came crashing down upon us all as a consequence of the confluence of the current pandemic with its obvious dimension of structural racism, indigenous black Latinx communities uh, suffer disproportionately. Um, that the mention of structural racism um, with respect to healthcare and the visibility of racist police violence, finally perceived as structural and not primarily the product of the individual racism of, of, of the cops. Now, the, the, the most widespread term that's being used to define this moment is reckoning, um, which is a process which is not going to be quickly concluded. Uh, and I just want to say that um, if we don't recognize the impact of racial capitalism, we won't be able fully to understand the nature of structural racism. So um, this is a period, I think, where uh, institutions, some institutions are, are, are attempting to examine 
uh, their own structures and to figure out how they have participated in this process of reproducing structural racism. But I think that, that, that um, if we wanna know where we're going from here, um, I think we, we really ought to ask ourselves, what is the path we should be on uh, rather than where should we be? How we should be moving and hopefully we are moving uh, forward. Dr. Molina, that question, where do we go from here? Wow, so thank you for having me, Babu. Um, I'm grateful to be on this panel. I'm grateful for the way in which each of you continues to feed my soul and guide us and guide this movement forward. Um, I'm grateful for um, our late night calls when we talk about what's happening in the world and um, you're, you're grounding me over the years in Pan-Africanism. Um, I'm grateful for Dr. Horn's 7,846 books that he's <laughs> written um, that um, remind me of the power of intellectual tools um, as we work towards the transformation of the world in which we live. Um, I'm grateful for Dr. Davis, who I actually had the great privilege of meeting when I was a sixth grader in Oakland, mm -hmm. California, um, and was in the NAACP AXO competition. And remember you being in the room as one, I think you were a judge. And from that moment forward, you've just had such a tremendous impact on my life not just as an intellectual and model as I, that I look to from afar, but more recently as one that I can look to um, in the present and grounding me and um, what it means to say, you know what, I have a right to go to sleep. <laughs> I have a right to healthy food and all of those things help to strengthen me for the struggle for liberation of our people. And then of course, Jasmine, who is, um, not a member of Black Lives Matter, she will always say, but absolutely committed to the freedom and liberation of Black people with her whole and complete self. So everyone who's here, I'm grateful to be here. Um, where do we go from here? Um, I think that this is a moment um, when the world has cracked wide open. And where we go from here depends on our willingness to be courageous and visionary and abolitionist in our frame. Where we go from here depends on our willingness to say, I'm gonna put everything that I have into upending unjust systems that were deliberately and intentionally designed to produce these outcomes. And simultaneously, as I live and try to um, practice what Dr. Davis teaches us about abolitionism. Abolitionism is absolutely about upending those systems and must also be about visioning and building new ones, right? What Robin Kelly calls freedom dreaming, right? And freedom building. And so where we go from here depends on whether or not we're trying to get back to a world that was never meant for the freedom of our people, a society that was never meant for the freedom of our people, whether or not we're trying to get back to um, a liberal brand of white supremacy, um, of a form of white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism that's just kinder and gentler, right? Or whether or not we're willing to say, you know what, we are not tethering ourselves to a system that keeps us oppressed. We are going to break those chains, cling to each other, and demand something visionary. And then I'll, I'll just end with this, that I think that we can learn so much from our young people. You know, here in Los Angeles, our children, and by children, I mean children, as young as 10 years old, who have said we are defunding the police, we are removing police from our school campuses, we're demanding that 
dollars be invested specifically and explicitly in black children. And we are going to fight and fight and fight for community schools and to make Black Lives Matter on our campuses. And we're gonna be unapologetic about it. And so we can take their courage, their audacity, their vision, and their willingness to struggle as a lesson for all of us, that that is the same way that we have to be willing to fight to end policing, to end prisons, to end jails, to end oppressive models of education, to end medical apartheid, um, and to usher in new models that truly get us free. So it depends on us. Where we go from here depends on us. Dr. Horn. Well, first of all, I'd like to echo what has been said thus far. And in the first place, thank you for including me in this discussion. I'd also like to co-sign the exceedingly perceptive comments by the previous panelists, as well as the extremely perceptive question posed by yourself. To answer your question, let's first of all, take a stroll down history's lane, memory lane. Uh, from the beginning of this system known as settler colonialism with the invasion of Europeans in the 1500s, you've had this contradiction. On the one hand, you had enslaved Africans brought across the Atlantic who by dint of the oppression and ferocious atrocities to which they were subjected to, helped to contribute to a fierce class struggle by the enslaved class of Africans. Yet at the same time, we were inserted into a system, settler colonialism, poor, middle class, and rich. And of course, you saw an echo of that class collaboration uh, on, in November 2020, uh, when 75 million people uh, voted for an avowed racist and imperialist. Uh, I think it should be noted that it would be mathematically imprecise to suggest that 75 million is part of the 1% in a nation of 325 million. However, the way we were able to countervail these dire odds historically was internationalizing our struggle. Uh, that is to say in St. Augustine, Florida, the first node of settler colonialism in 1565, we oftentimes allied with the indigenous population against the Spanish, we allied with the French against the Spanish. And then as the English and London began to invade, we allied with the Spanish against London. That's the import of Stono's revolt in 1739 in South Carolina, the bloodiest revolt in the history of uh, slavery in colonial North America. Then after the rebels led by real estate speculator, George Washington took over in 1776, 1789, we then allied with London <laughs> against the settlers led by George Washington as evidenced by the War of 1812. You might note that the Star Spangled Banner in this third stanza denounces us specifically for what we did during the War of 1812, whereby we joined the Redcoats in August 1814 and sending James Madison and his girlless spouse Dolly fleeing into the streets one step ahead of the posse, then escaping on British vessels to Trinidad and Tobago where the descendants of those enslaved Africans continue to reside. And then going forward in the 20th century, you saw certain black nationalists aligning with Tokyo. You saw socialists aligning with Moscow. But then comes the compromise of 1954 uh, that is to say, Brown versus Board of Education, the juridical retreat, the most egregious aspects of Jim Crow, whereby a deal was cut that in return for softening the harsh edges of Jim Crow, uh, many of the tallest trees in our forests had to be jettisoned, Paul Robeson in the first instance. And this compromises our internationalist agenda. I might also say that it's harmful to the United States as a whole because with the internationalist jettison, it facilitates the involvement in U of US imperialism and all these misadventures from Korea in the 1950s, Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s, Afghanistan is still continuing to this very day, Iraq, Panama, El Salvador, Nicaragua, apartheid South Africa, Angola, et cetera. 
And so it's apparent that in terms of where do we go from here, we have to uh, resuscitate and revive what has helped us to survive, which is internationalizing our struggle. And I would take my hat off if I had one on to Martin Luther King III, who just returned from Mexico, where he met with the president of Mexico, AMLO. Uh, this was an homage to President Vicente Guerrero, who was of African descent and who spearheaded the abolition of slavery in Mexico in 1829. And of course, uh, this helped to spark the secession of Texas, where I'm now sitting, uh, from Mexico uh, in 1836 on explicitly uh, anti-abolitionist grounds, and the abolition of slavery grounds. And uh, I'd like to compliment uh, Martin Luther King III, but then also urge him to bring delegations from the NAACP leadership, the Black Lives Matter leadership, Congressional Black Caucus, not only to uh, Mexico City, but of course to CARICOM headquarters in Georgetown, Guyana, because of course CARICOM, the Caribbean community is heavily involved and invested in the struggle for reparations which we are also heavily involved and invested in. The African Union headquarters, of course, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, European Union uh, headquarters in Brussels, because we need to take advantage, as our ancestors once did, of the contradictions between and amongst the various powers. And certainly, we should uh, not rule out in that context uh, taking our delegations and our solidarity to Havana, uh, Beijing, and Moscow. And I say that as well, because I think historians will eventually conclude, assuming that nuclear war or climate change do not rid us all from this planet, that January 6, 2021 was a hinge moment when you had the kind of multi-class formations that were involved in the onset of settler colonialism in the 1500s, uh, then rose up <laughs> in, in 2021. Uh, armed to the teeth, constructing gallows on the grounds of Congress uh, with firearms, homemade napalm, uh, baseball bats, bear spray, pepper spray, et cetera, uh, seeking to block the last step in terms of what has been called the peaceful transfer of power. I think that that was a signal <laughs> if any of us needed one. It was a wake up call if any of us needed one. And I think that what that suggests is that we need to return to what helped to bring us to this point. And in that regard, let me just tick off a number of immediate issues we need to address. Uh, the George Floyd Policing Act, for example, which would help to implement part of the uh, anti-police terror uh, agenda, uh, for example, in terms of seeking to circumscribe no-knock raids that claim the life of Breonna Taylor or uh, chokeholds that claim the life of Eric Garner and, in a sense, uh, George Floyd as well. Uh, we need to talk about uh, beating back this attempt to circumscribe the right to vote because the right wing has decided they don't want to see a replay of November 2020. So they're busily uh, seeking to curb the franchise and the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act and HR1 uh, in Congress uh, will help to stay that to a certain degree. Certainly the PRO Act, uh, which of course uh, calls for the organizing of more, making it easier to organize unions because we're mostly a working class people. Uh, we're more pro-union than most sectors of this society. And this would help to unleash union power if passed. And certainly uh, with regard to um, HR 40, the Reparations Act, which I think is looking brighter today than it has at any time since the idea was first brooded. But to con conclude, uh, I'm happy to see that many of our uh, anti-police terror activists are bringing a case before the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland. And there have been a number of human rights investigations of the United States in that regard. But certainly, if we tightened up our international alliances, and focus more on global solidarity, I think it would be more likely that that very impressive initiative in Geneva, Switzerland that's proceeding as we speak would eventuate in success. Thank you very much. Mr. Jasmine. Yes. Yes, ma'am. The same question? Or add some to it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was sitting here thinking about that because, you know, when you ask, where do we go from here? I think also you have to ask, where do you want to go? What's, what's the end goal? You know, because that's going to dictate hopefully how, um, what, what you do to get there. I think that this for me, I'm 43. This is very interesting time for me, um, just as a black woman, just, you know, seeing for the first time in this country that we're, that I've experienced where we're having these conversations, where we're, we're pushing back and we're challenging things that normally we would not challenge, that we would just, you know, let happen. Um, as a black woman, I feel like this is probably the first time, and I don't know how long it's going to last, so I'm, I'm trying to ride it while I can, that black women are being listened to, that we're actually being seen right now, because normally we are invisible. Um, but like I said, I don't know how long that's going to last, so, you know, we got to get in there and do what we got to do right now. So, I mean, we have seen a lot of movements as black people right so i'm one of the producers of 41st and central um the untold story of the la black panthers and in working on that with gregory everett um you know i learned a lot about um what was going on in los angeles back in the 60s and i know uh, dr davis knows a lot about that um particularly with the panther party and what the lapd was doing when i think about the and I think you mentioned this earlier, Melina, you had mentioned that we can learn so much from young people. One of the things that struck me the most in doing the research on 41st and Central was how young everybody was. They were 17, 18, 19 years old, literally getting in shootouts with the police, right? And I just remember myself at 17, 18, and 19, and you know, you couldn't, that was like the last thing on my mind, right? And so when we fast forward today and I look at the people, I look at all of us in the streets and we're marching and we're demanding things. And I, you know, what I guess for me, I keep thinking about is when will this, when will this part stop? When will we have to stop doing this, right? Because I always think like this, we have yet to have a generation of black people born in this country that didn't have to fight for something as some, we just have not had that generation born yet. And I'm hopeful that um, with the work of people like Melina and Black Lives Matter and other folks that maybe this is that this is that breaking point where we finally get to that point where you know in my lifetime we can have a generation of black babies born that don't have to fight that don't have to struggle that can be all of who they are, no matter what that is. And we just haven't had that yet. And that's what I, that's where I want to see us go. I, I, the older I get, the more I think about the people coming up behind me and how to make it easier for them, you know, because I know what our struggles were. You know, my struggles weren't the same as yours, Babu and Dr. Horn and, and Professor Davis. You guys paved the way for my generation, but my, my generation has some struggles too. And I just hope that when, you know, my generation leaves this world, we have left it in a, in a, in a state, in a condition that these younger, the ones yet to be born and the ones who are just now being born now are going to benefit from in the way that I did from the work that you guys did. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, one one of the um, sort of what you're saying uh, is there's an unspoken question within if these are the realities that we've all kind of talked about the last few minutes, and they're the realities of our lifetime, the realities of the foreseeable future. One of the questions is, what can individuals do to better live through these realities and find relative peace, balance, fulfillment, and freedom? And we'd like to see what, what y'all think about that. We can start with Professor Davis about what 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 do we say to young people? In, young people ask all the time, what can we do? You just raised a lot of those questions, uh, which, which you said. Uh, so I would like to see Dr. Davis, can you have, what, what, how does it, what does a young person do, individual, even an older individual do to find relative peace, balance, fulfillment, and freedom in this context? Well, you know, 
I also think that we should be searching for more interesting, more fulfilling, more creative uh, ways to struggle. And um, Jasmine, I totally appreciate your remarks uh, and, and excuse me for not acknowledging you in my opening comments, but this is the first time I believe we've actually met. Uh, um, but I wanna say, I wanna sort of take issue with one thing that you said. Uh, um, and that is that we are struggling to get someplace where we can rest, uh, where we won't have to struggle any longer. Um, because I've seen the, the struggle for Black liberation as having been so generative, as, as having produced so much. Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, we're doing this panel for the uh, Pan-African Film Festival. And when one considers all of the art that has been produced around uh, the, the whole process of engaging in struggles for freedom, um, the art, the music especially. Um, and I don't know whether we will ever reach a point where we can say, we're free, we can stop, we can rest. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we did, I think it might be a bit boring. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and what I find so exciting about my, my own experiences in the movement for you know, all of these decades is that in the very process of engaging in struggle for freedom, we acquire a sense of the complexity of freedom and of the fact that there are dimensions of freedom that never occurred to us and would never have occurred to us had we not been in struggle. Uh, uh, so I often point out that when I first became involved as a teenager, uh, for me, Black freedom was equivalent to freedom for the Black man. And I did not even know how to write myself uh, into that, that struggle. And of course, uh, as you point, point out, this is a moment that we really have to greet with enthusiasm and excitement because it's really the first time in our history that there's been such a vast visibility of black women, uh, black women leaders, and not, not only contemporary leaders, Black Lives Matter and you know, all of the, uh, the, 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 the campaigns and movements around uh, uh, that demand, um, uh, but you know, but but also the 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 the, the fact that um, that we're returning to unfulfilled moments in our history, and we are retrieving them. Ella Baker was completely marginalized during her time when she talked about the fact that uh, uh, we didn't need these you know charismatic uh, you know male individualistic figures, uh, and that didn't resonate so much in the 60s, uh, but now it's the theme of imagining new forms of leadership, new forms of struggle. And for me, that is so exciting. I, I, can, I can imagine a hundred years from now, uh, uh, people coming up with, with ideas uh, that, uh, that we never could have imagined. So I hope this struggle continues. I don't want the suffering to continue. I don't want the pain to continue. You know, I don't want the violent racism to continue, but I don't want us to give up uh, uh, the quest uh, for uh, better ways of, of, of relating to one another and um, you know, for, for an abolitionist future or for abolitionist futures. Uh, let me uh, uh, put it in the um, plural. Yes, I have to put myself on mute because I'm your absolute amen corner and I keep talking, um, you know, you know, amening what you're saying, Dr. Davis. I'm so grateful for you. It feels like you're kind of speaking your book, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, right? That freedom is a constant struggle. And um, I love what you're saying because for me, you know, who was born in the 70s in Oakland, California, and kind of came into 
um, the world in a space and at a time that um, kind of required my eyes being open to a certain degree. Um, I think that there's kind of a, a space in this world or a misunderstanding um, that's been deliberately encouraged that the purpose of our life is to seek out happiness, right? Is to um, just seek out joy. But I, I find that the purpose of our life is to seek out purpose, right? And um, when you talk about ideas like fulfillment, right? That the idea of freedom being a constant struggle and fulfillment, it was actually for me through this work in Black Lives Matter that I've come to understand um, what, is, what is the Franz Fanon quote, right? That each generation must out of relatively relative obscurity discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. Figuring out, discovering our mission, right? Discovering our mission. And I think that there's a piece of it that is giving to the world, but there's also a piece of it that is a gift to ourselves because when we discover our mission, when we understand our purpose, when we seek fulfillment, not just temporary joy and happiness, we have this thing that endures, that carries us through life. And um, so I'm grateful that I'm raising children who find fulfillment in the struggle, right? So, you know, you know, my daughters and sometimes my son, they play soccer, right? And, you know, they skateboard and they do all of those things that children do, but they also have found fulfillment in the struggle. And I think that we also, as we talk about the struggle, need to think about the beauty of the struggle and understand the beauty of the struggle. And this was kind of part of your initial question, Babu, about how we step into the struggle. I think it's also recognizing that we all step into the struggle differently. And for some folks, if we think about Nina Simone, if we think about Sam Cooke, right? If we think about, um, you know, wonderful artists, Aloe Black, you know? how they use their art for the struggle. If we think about all of those filmmakers that are part of Pan-African Film Festival using art for the struggle. If we think about educators um, and, you know, I keep talking about, I've talked in my last comment about the AXO competition. Mr. Navies was one of the people, Richard Navies at Berkeley High School was one of the people that brought me so that I could be in community as a little girl, as, a, as a, an emerging, um, person to meet Angela Davis, right? And he was an educator who shaped an entire generation of Black young people in the Bay Area, right? His education, his ability to educate and speak to us in ways that nobody else could, the way that my mother did it, the way that my grandmother does it, right? Um, those are their ways of stepping into struggle. And I think about people who are in this movement alongside me. I think about the way that Sister Jan Williams, who's part of the Black Lives Matter Los Angeles core team can talk one-on-one -on -one to people and get them to basically do anything, right? So, you know, you need people to sign a petition, ask Jan to ask them. You need people to get on a bus and go protest the district attorney, get Jan to ask them, right? And really that's what Mama Ella Baker was talking about when she talked about group-centered leadership, that how we move into the struggle is really dependent upon those gifts, those talents, those resources, those um, kind of spaces that have been endowed, those, those endowments that we have that are then used for the benefit of our people and for the purpose of freedom struggle. So I think that we all step into it differently. Your journalistic talents, Jasmine, right? Um, are all how we step into it, but all of those tools, all of those gifts, all of those talents, all of those resources are part of this beautiful struggle that's grounded in all of us taking full advantage of this moment 
when the world is cracked wide open and we can indeed not just imagine the world we want to live in, but move towards it and build it. Amen. Dr. Horn. Well, first of all, let me co-sign the perceptive comments that have been made thus far. And secondly, uh, issue in response to your question, an SOS, that is to say, what is to be done with regard to individuals? What I mean by that is study organized struggle. Study, because one of the central bits of advice I would offer to younger people coming up nowadays is take advantage of foreign language instruction, uh, not only with regard to Spanish while you're in the state of California, uh, but uh, also communicating hemispherically, uh, French, Portuguese, et cetera. And then of course, communicating uh, continentally, that is to say in the African continent, Kiswahili, Kikongo, uh, Zulu, uh, for example. And of course, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, Arabic, uh, Russian. Uh, so studying foreign languages, I, I would also say, uh, as a historian, I'm partial to the study of history. And so let me also say, I think that younger people should try to acquaint themselves with the major trends over the past millennia, because that might give some idea as to where we're going in the next millennium. Uh, I would also say that with regard to uh, study, that uh, we're talking in the context of the Pan-African Film Festival. And one of the things that the Pan-African Film Festival does quite well year after year after year is particularly bring uh, documentaries uh, to our attention that are quite illuminating and quite educational, but it also brings to our attention uh, dramatic features that help to tell a new kind of story. I'm thinking of Bell which you uh, exhibited uh, a few years ago, which presents a, a new story of the abolition of slavery, for example, uh, which does not uh, privilege this sort of US centric uh, mod, model, uh, model, mode of development that you see, for example, in the movie, The Patriot, mm -hmm. or the BET Canadian broadcasting, South African broadcasting uh, multi-part series, The Book of Negroes, readily available, Tell, tells the story of our revolt in North America through the eyes of the enslaved. And once again, the narrative arc is not necessarily, although I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any necessary complaint about this since I'm still here, but it doesn't necessarily seek our redemption here in North America. The, the, the main characters are all repatriate <laughs> to, to Africa to seek redemption. And then, of course, the Judas and the Black Messiah, which is readily available now, which in some ways exceeds the historians in telling a complicated story of political struggle in the 1960s. Um, it, it really surpasses the historians. In many ways, it puts the historians to shame. And uh, I could go on in this vein with regard to study, although uh, I would be remiss if I did not also mentioned since I'm talking about feature films, this virtual tidal wave of novels that are coming out mm -hmm. by uh, black women novelists in particular. It, it's so many that it's very hard to keep up with, quite frankly, which leads to organizing because uh, to link study and organizing, uh, I, I'm old enough to recall an era when study groups were the thing to do. Uh, I get the idea that it's not so much the thing to do nowadays, but organizing study groups focusing around some of these issues that I've talked about would be quite useful. And not to mention the sturdy perennials, organizing student unions, tenant unions, labor unions, uh, organizing around our concrete and material uh, circumstances and conditions, uh, which then of course is a form of struggle. That is to say, uh, saluting Sister Abdullah with regard to Black Lives Matter, expanding uh, that struggle, uh, expanding the struggle the Sister Kanek has been involved in, who I've been following very carefully uh, with regard to the struggles in Los Angeles. It, it's, it's an exemplar of what an individual can do uh, by dint of her own journalistic and organizing talents. And so in, in some ways, Babu, the question that you're posing 
is both simple and complex. Jasmine. You know, Babu always asks simple yet complex questions. <laughs> and that's just ever since I've known him. Great question. Love all the answers that have me really sitting here thinking about my own journey and how it's centered around the Pan-African Film Festival. I was just a worker bee. Like literally all I did was like work and come home, like do all the, wasn't participating in any community, anything. I was just here um, until uh, I hooked up with the film festival. I um, worked in advertising at the time, remember? And we, uh, I was able to get the film festival to advertise on cable. And I actually stayed with the film festival. Like I got involved with it. And I, you know, I remember wearing weaves and my hair really straight. And the next thing you knew, I had locks. And you know, I had completely started learning about my black history, this black girl who grew up in Hermosa Beach and really didn't know her history. But one of the things that um, stayed with me, and you know, I do credit the film festival and Asante Juan Babu and the whole PATH family and everyone that it brings together with is just helping and urging and pushing you into your whatever your role is going to be. I always tell everybody, everybody's role is not going to be a starring role. You're going to have some people out front. You're going to have some people out back. I always tell people, we all can't be in the same place at the same time because we need some people left to tell the story and what happened. You know, we have, everybody has a different role. And I just kind of made my own path. I figured out what it was going to be, but it was always going to be something to help the community, right? And so... Sometimes, and I don't know if you ever struggle with this, Melina, but sometimes, you know, when we do this work, like, I'm like, oh, you know, you're trying to help your people, and then your people looking at you crazy, like, you know, they're not trying to be helped, you know, and you got to keep on keeping on, because you know, at the end of the day, they need the help, even if they don't know that they need the help right now, and sometimes I struggle with that, because, you know, there's always this question of, well, is everybody going to make it? Like, is everybody going to be able to get to the promised land or wherever it is we're going. And I don't know that answer because, you know, not everybody is like us sitting on this panel, right? Not everyone is thinking about the community and thinking in terms of, you know, how do we push the struggle forward? How do we, you know, move our people forward? But it never stops any of us from continuing to do whatever we can do to help all of our people, right? And so, you know, I, one of the things you said, Dr. Horn, where you were talking about the films that the festival brings um, and how they they help teach us things. One of the films that the festival is has brought this year, which came into the festival and then elevated up to being the closing night film is Executive Order. And a reason why for me that film stands out is because you know, I have a lot of friends from Brazil. I have a lot of friends who go back and forth to Brazil. And they're always talking about the racism that um, we face in Brazil. And for this story to be told in the way that it's told, you know, I'm sure the government of Brazil is going to be quite embarrassed um, because this, this filmmaker really illustrated that in a way that it needed to be said and put on screen and it hasn't ever not that i can think of i can never i have never seen a film about the racism in brazil um period and so executive order i think for a lot of people is going to be eye-opening they're not they probably have no idea how black people are treated in brazil and this is going to um you know, open their eyes to that. And then for the rest of us, we're gonna say, oh, I'm so glad that story is being told. And this film is gonna start making its way around um, the world through, through film festivals. And, you know, Brazil, like I said, the government's probably not very pleased about it, but that is exactly what's happening, right? In, in, in Brazil. So, you know, I thank the festival for always making sure that even in our narrative films, we walk away with some sort of education as it relates to Black people and our struggle, whether it's in the US or in China or in Sierra Leone. 
right? Because we, you know, the festival brings films from all over the country, wherever you find Black people, right? So, yeah. So I think, you know, as an individual, I like I said, I think everybody has to kind of find where they're, what their role is and get into it. I think that's half the battle is, you know, deciding to step into it and understanding that, you know, every role isn't for everybody. And that's a struggle in itself within our community. Um, and I will end on this. I do want to say this because it was touched on earlier. I am happy, Professor Davis and Melina, that we are in a time. You know, I just go around the country speaking at universities and colleges and stuff, and I would talk about Black leadership. And I would always say, you know, when it comes to Black people, the only people who could be leaders were Black males over 65 with Reverend or Doctor before their name who were presumed to be heterosexual. Those were the only people that who could be leaders for Black people. And that used to really piss me off. And I'm so happy that in 2021, we're having these conversations where Black women who are in their 40s and their 30s and their 20s, Black women like me who are lesbians, Black women who are mothers, Black women, you know, we can be leaders as well. And that is finally starting to resonate with people. You know, no shade to, you know, Al Sharpton, Reverend Sharpton and, and Reverend Jackson, but there's some other people as well that got things to say and are just as equally gifted at being leaders. And a lot of those people are Black women, as demonstrated on this panel. <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the uh, issues that's, that's come up in uh, Dr. Davis, uh, Professor Davis has um, articulated a concept called inter intersectionality. And intersectionality is, is uh, resonates with Brazil, multicultural societies like Brazil, the United States, and the UK. Um, one of the film that we deal with uh, that you mentioned, Executive uh, Orders, is a film, uh, by the way, the director is uh, Brother Lazarus, one of the top Black actors from uh, uh, Lazarus. Ramos, um, I think, Ramos, yeah. Yeah, uh, top Black actor from Brazil. This is his first directorial debut. And what the story is, for those who haven't seen it yet, be sure and look at it. At the, at, I think it's last night on the 14th, I believe it is. Um, it's a story about a, a right-wing government, which is like in Brazil today, and some progressive lawyers bring suit to demand reparations for Black folks in Brazil, which is, you know, it's the largest group of Black folks uh, outside of Africa uh in 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 the world and um the they think they're slick so they decide well, we're not going to pay reparations but what we'll do is this we will um have you we'll issue an order an executive order to send you back to africa and we're going to determine how we how you go back to africa based on the level of uh, mil uh melanin in your in your body well, of course, black folks revolted. <laughs> you know, there's some said, I want to go back. Some said, I want to stay. Uh, all these issues come up and in it, of course, the intersectionality comes up and it all dovetails into monopoly capitalism, white supremacy, et cetera. Um, and that's, I'd like, if you got a chance, uh, Professor Davis talk a little bit about what is intersectionality at this point how does it look in, in, in Brazil? How does it look in South Africa? Does it look like in the United States, et cetera? Ooh. I know. <laughs> That's a huge question. And, uh, you know, it's um, Kimberly Crenshaw who's usually given credit for coining the term oh. intersectionality. But I think it's important to point out that Black women um, have always, uh, 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 for the most part, thought in inter intersectionally. And when you look at um, uh, the, 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 the history of Black women's participation in struggles against racism, you also see an insistence on, on gender, an insistence on class. You know, we're talking about Anna Julia Cooper, we're talking about Ida B. Wells, we're talking about Mary Church uh, Terrell. Um, and, 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 and I think that, um, the, the point that uh, Gerald has made so forcefully is that our 
perspective has to be internationalist. We actually um, engage in a process that militates against what we want to achieve if we think in terms, in narrow terms of, uh, of, of US centrism, uh, uh, which unfortunately too many of us have imbibed. And I'm, 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 in my opinion, when you ask, where do we go for here, from here? I think it has to be framed internationally. We have to think about uh, what we can learn from countries, from struggles in countries like Brazil. Um, and I, I tell you that, um, that I've been actually involved in um, uh, black feminist struggles in Brazil for you know, maybe the last 10 or 15 years. And I'm so excited about all of the things I've learned, but at the same time, I, 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 I'm troubled by the fact that in Brazil, people think they have to look towards the US, uh, of, particularly when they want uh, um, leadership around issues of black feminism. So, you know, there are a couple of people, a couple of um, US black feminists who always get invited to come to Brazil to explain what black feminism is. But if you look at the history, of black feminism in Brazil, uh, you see, uh, you see um, strategies and ways of uh, and perspectives that we've never had the opportunity to develop here. And I'm thinking about the role of women, for example, in the religious traditions, the role of women in Condomble, which gives has given women, black women, uh, a leadership capacity uh, that um, that we haven't known in this country. You know, I'm thinking about the fact that in Brazil, black women have organized unions around domestic workers. And for example, in Bahia, there is a powerful domestic workers union. And we in this country have been trying to organize domestic workers union, you know, since, since two centuries ago or whenever. Uh, so the point that I'm making is that if we can be a little bit more humble, if we recognize that just because we live in the US, uh, uh, we do not have all of the answers. If we learn that we, we can not only um, express solidarity with struggles unfolding in Brazil, in Uruguay, for example, which is a very interesting place with, with respect to struggles against racism, um, um, you know, also uh, in the continent of Africa, certainly, but that we, 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 could, we should not only express solidarity, but we, we can learn from uh, the, the struggles they're undertaking. Um, I am um, I'm interested in what's happening in France right now. Uh, you know, because France is always considered to be the, the kind of origin of a modern democracy. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the 1789 French Revolution. And, and, and of course, nobody ever talks about the fact that it was Haiti uh, that actually got to produce a kind of non-racial democracy uh, uh, for the first time in, 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 in our history. And Haiti has been completely marginalized. Uh, but in France, of course, uh, they're now grappling with questions of of racism. Uh, you know, France was willing to support uh, uh, people in this country struggling against racism, people in, in South Africa struggling against apartheid. But of course, in France, there is no racism. Uh, uh, and that is because they have these beautiful ideal, you know, these beautiful um, universalisms uh, of, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, everybody who is a citizen of France is free by virtue of that citizenship. Uh, and you're not even allowed to keep records that uh, uh, reflect issues of, of race and or religion. Uh, because of course, Islamophobia, the Islamophobia that is, uh, uh, has been enabled by the French notion of laïcité, of, of secularity, is actually um, horrendous and violent. Uh, so, you know, I do think that if we want to know where we're going from here, we have to join 
an international um, community. Uh, we have to encourage internationalism. Uh, uh, we have to recognize that racism is not centered in the US, that the colonialism, the settler colonialism and, and the slavery uh, that gave rise to this era has had an impact on virtually every place on the planet. And this is now an internationalist uh, a movement. Uh, but thank you so much for um, uh, mentioning Brazil. And let me also point out that Black women are in the forefront of the struggle in Brazil. It's the Black women's movement that has challenged uh, Bolsonaro with uh, 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 and, and, and following in the assassination, following the assassination of uh, Marielle Franco, uh, uh, large numbers of Black women are now uh, moving into um, 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 parliament and are, 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 are being elected. As a matter of fact, we had the first Black trans woman elected uh, in, 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 in Rio um, uh, maybe two years ago. So I think that, um, that um, yeah, intersectionality is also intersectionality of struggles. And I think that's the most important uh, uh, resonance of that notion of intersectionality at this moment. We did get a chance to talk about uh, what's happening in the South-South cooperation between the uh, rise of the uh, Asian nations, the China, the rise of China, which has clearly changed the conversation in terms of uh, capitalism, monopoly capitalism and its cooperation with South Africa. Can we talk about uh, how that, the, the cooperation of South-South between all these new countries, the countries you mentioned, Angela, and what, what should we learn and how can we use it here inside the United States and what can we do to help those struggles? So Dr. Horn, you wanna talk about that a little bit and, and Melina, then we'll come back with Angela. Well, sure. I mean, it's quite striking to note, and it's rarely acknowledged, at least in the elite circles, that the rise of China, in part, is a product of what happened about 50 years ago when Henry Kissinger went to China and tried to negotiate an anti Soviet Entente, which then led to massive foreign direct investment. Uh, into China. Obviously, Washington did not envision that they were creating what Richard Nixon came to call a Frankenstein monster. <laughs> but in any case, what's happening now that is facilitated by what I made reference to a few moments ago, which is that many of our organizations and leaders and intellectuals have abandoned the internationalist front uh, that facilitates the launching of what not only will be a new Cold War, with China in the crosshairs, but also will be a kind of dual containment where Washington will seek to try to circumscribe both China and Russia. And this is at a time when both nations are sending vaccines to developing countries to help to arrest the pandemic, uh, particularly countries like Zimbabwe, which are on a so-called blacklist by Washington being sanctioned and therefore they're saving lives. But it's not only that, there seems to be a hysteria, not only about the rise of China and, and it's building infrastructure in Ethiopia, Djibouti, uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa and elsewhere. Of late, there's a similar hysteria about Turkey's role in Africa, particularly in Somalia, where it plays a, a, a sizable role in terms of helping to try to keep that country together. And I think it would not be unfair to draw the inference that the North Atlantic nations led by the United States see Africa as a particular preserve. <laughs> and they want to block other nations uh, from tampering with what they consider to be their preserve. It's, it's a kind of colonialist or neo-colonialist mentality. And I think it would be a grave mistake if somehow uh, folks in our community fell victim to that psychosis because I think historians of the future, uh, assuming that humanity survives, will be struck by how many in our community basically supported US foreign policy either directly or by their absence, uh, which was wholly against our interests. And uh, I know that uh, Sister Abdullah needs to leave soon, so I'll, I'll defer to her. 
So I'm just going to say um, again how grateful I am to be in community and um, look forward to continuing to struggle forward. Um, and especially in partnership and with the inspiration of, and in, um, yeah, with the inspiration of all of those on this panel, all of those who are engaged in the work, whatever form it takes. And we wanna call people into this movement. We wanna remind people not to fall back on this idea that there's some state of normalcy that we should be seeking to return to. There is no point of return, at least not you know, since our arrival on this continent in this country that um, is good or lib uh, that liberates black people. And so we can only struggle forward, of course, learning um, from the past and thinking about the principle of Sankofa and summoning in those who were courageous enough and visionary enough to come up with ideas that might not have been celebrated during their time, but have been instructive in this one. And so again, I'm really grateful for all of the work that those on this panel and beyond have been engaged in. And thank you for your constant um, mentorship and modeling um, and solidarity in the work. Before you leave, I want to point something out, which I forgot to it actually passed through my mind and get back to it. One of the things that I noticed uh, last time I was on the continent, uh, when George Floyd uh, was brutally killed and murdered, as you know, and Black Life Matters responded, well, there were thousands and thousands of young people all over the continent, all over the Caribbean, all over in China, that raised that question um, and and pointed out and was, it was really, really an example of international solidarity. That showed an example of one of the things is that when Angela, you were raising the question that there's so many traditional indigenous development and it's the same thing, look to the United States. What, what that's about is that because the United States is, is front and center in the leadership, they pay attention to that. But also there is, since we have a, we, what we call soul and, and a, a, a African consciousness and spirit, people pick up on that around the world. And so when they see us stand up and resist, that gives everybody some energy. It gives us energy when we saw Fidel stand up they back, back and forth. But Black Lives Matters had a major impact all over the young people on the continent. And they said, we can do this too. We have the same situation with the young filmmakers that come here and we have a, uh, uh, a luncheon with the DGA, Directors Guild of America, the union of the uh, filmmakers. And they all wanna go back to their countries and organize DGAs there, Directors of Guilds of America, to protect themselves and so forth and so on. So it's a constant interaction. But anyway. So I just wanted to say what an honor it was to be on a panel with so many people that I have so much respect for. And that, you know, it for me, I, you know, I believe my journey moving forward also means studying what happened before I got here and learning from people who um, we're in the struggle long before me. It, that has always been the way that I have thought. You know, I do look towards the future, but I definitely want to know what happened in my past. And I'm so happy that we have people like you, you, Dr. Horn, and you, Bob Wu, and Melina, who are here to tell people like me, you know, the stories of the things that happened before. So that, again, we don't repeat the same mistakes, but we continue to move forward in this struggle. So it's an honor to be asked to be on this panel. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for including me in this illustrious panel. I trust that what I'm about to say will not bring a reprimand from the screening committee of the Pan-African Film Festival, but I would really like to see the youth uh, using their mobile phones to create pandemic diaries and documentaries about their life, particularly during this special period that we've endured since uh, March, 2020. I think that uh, it could be quite, uh, quite informative. In fact, I could see an entire film festival comprised of these pandemic diaries. And even without thinking of a pandemic diary, I'd like to see the youth use these kinds of devices to make documentaries in general about their life in school, about their competition on the basketball court or their, their dance moves or whatever. Thank you once again.
Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, panel uh, that is uh, going to be uh, shown during the Pan-African Film Festival. And let me say that uh, film is such an important medium. Um, I can remember uh, when Usman Somben uh, uh, actually uh, directed the very first film from Africa, south of the Sahara, uh, La Noir De. And so it's been quite exciting to see the flourishing of talent all over the continent and all over the world uh, where there are people of African descent. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that art, uh, um, film, whether we're talking about dramatic film or we're, whether we're talking about documentaries can move people in a different way, uh, can, and can provide a different kind of knowledge uh, that is also uh, grounded in feeling and therefore can uh, help push people to uh, become involved in efforts to uh, change the world. I'm, I'm so excited that uh, Babu, uh, this festival uh, has been around for uh, how many years now? Um, a couple of decades, uh, and 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 we need more of 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 this kind of opportunity to share the 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 creative work that is happening, you know, all over the world because that is an important dimension of our quest for freedom as well. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody who participated in this. These are. Uh, folks that, that I listen to all the time. So thank you for taking your time, your, your, giving your energy to be a part of this. And we're gonna to try to send this all across the planet for folks to pay attention to. So thank you so much for being here. And my sister, long time sister, Sister Angela, which gave me a better interpretation of France for known. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Hi, I'm Gerald Horn, historian and activist, and I want to invite you to check out our panel, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, at this year's Pan-African Film Festival, February 28th through March 14th, featuring such luminaries as Ayuko Babu, the director of the festival, Angela Davis, Melina Abdullah, Jazz Mechanic, and many more. Get your tickets today at paff.org.